Dr. Seal, Pernessa, thank you so much for joining us and helping me to try to inspire the next generation of USC School of Social Work uh, students. Uh, we are going to do some focus groups talking to these students about activism within their communities. And I really wanted to meet you and talk with you to get some inspiration from you about what you faced as you were starting your own organization to get people aware and feeling like AIDS is actually their responsibility. I'm an immunologist by uh, educational design and found myself in New York after working briefly for CDC and just wanted to get to New York. If I could make it in New York, I could make it anywhere. Uh, and long, the long, the short version is the AIDS epidemic hit New York, and I became one of the first AIDS educators in the city, uh, and found a job at Harlem Hospital. Now this is after doing uh, malaria research at Rockefeller University and doing cancer research at Sloan Kettering, and just being young and not wanting to do it anymore. Uh, and I have an affinity for young people who don't know what they want to do. Uh, so I got a job at Harlem Hospital, and I was just uh, devastated by, at that time, 90% of the people in Harlem Hospital had HIV. They were dying of HIV. And no one in this community in Harlem, with over 350 churches, were coming to the bedside. It was just nobody was coming. The mothers, fathers, pastors, no one was coming. And, you know, I just got an idea. The idea was a Harlem week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. I, my supervisor were like, okay, go ahead. Uh, we've tried to work with these churches and we can't get anywhere, but if you think you can, you go right ahead. Uh, but the difference was, was that my approach was, you know, a cultural appropriate uh, a, a approach. I did not go with a banana and a condom. You know, I went with a, a, with a concept of who these people are. We could have been, I could have been talking about praying for rain, praying for, you know, violence to stop in the street, praying for economic development. But the, but the fact is that we are dealing with the African-American culture or African culture, wherever we are, in terms of our, our belief in this faith. You know, we believe in the power of prayer. I don't care where I stand in the world if I say prayer does what and everybody will respond, changes things. We How did you get from prayer to actual interaction among the people and activism? Well, I think that that is the that is the key, uh, because if you stop if you if you stop with oh these people are coming together to pray, you will miss the whole you'll miss the whole piece. Prayer in our community is a action verb, so the week of prayer not just bending down on your knees and praying, but it also means action. So we developed uh, educational tools. So every participating church had had to do, you, we were asked you had to do a sermon. You had to do some kind of AIDS education that week. We de develop, uh, we call them now toolkits, but back then it were brochures. Um, and uh, so there was, a, there was a major education component. It was all about education awareness. You know, it was, it was a media campaign, print, uh, social, we did not have social media back then, you know, we barely had, uh, we didn't have internet, a matter of fact, back then. There was no, there was, believe it or not, there was no email in 1989. Uh, or no Facebook or social media. So it, everything was print and we, we had brochures and uh, marketing tools and billboards and radio. And it was all about AIDS education, but AIDS education was in the, was, was kind of um, embodied in the cultural experience of prayer. So if we get stuck on the people praying for change, you miss it. It was using prayer as an action verb to do something. And the also, an, another key to it was bringing the community together. So it wasn't just, you know, the Baptists or the Methodists, it was Christians, it was Muslims, it was the oldest synagogue in New York, which is Ethiopian Hebrews. It was a, a re religious culture of a people coming together to address a disease that was devastating everybody. Were you able to get chaplains to bedsides? Yes. I remember you saying that was the, the glaring 
thing yes. in your vision was that these people were lying in their beds alone, scared in a hospital. Yes, and, and, and the one of the impact was a shift in actually churches starting AIDS ministries, and the ministry was responsible for coming to the to the bedsides for you know being an advocate for funeral homes who didn't want to bury people with HIV. You know these were the dark ages of AIDS when you know you, it it was just unheard of what people were doing in our society because of this epidemic. So as churches got involved. You know, a couple of things began to happen. First, you know, I remember one of the um, the the most influential pastors in Harlem, Reverend Dr. Y. T. Walker, at that the first week of prayer said, "I've already buried 70 men from my church." So by '89, 70 men from with AIDS had already died, but the week of prayer gave him a voice to speak that. To talk about pastors and, and imams and bishops were now able to say, you know, I just buried my nephew. So the, this opened up a, a conversation that they could not get to with the banana and a condom. Uh, the bomb in Gilead. How did I got the name? You know, honestly, it just came to me. Um, I had a book on my bookshelf by uh, Sarah Lightfoot who um, wrote a book, Bomb and Gilead. She was a nurse at Harlem Hospital. And um, it really didn't make too much sense to me, but now it does because we have, it's a song, you know, uh, there is a bomb in Gilead. You know, it's an old spiritual. Uh, and as a reference in the Hebrew book, the book of Jeremiah, where the prophet asks the question, is there no bomb? in Gilead. And, and I still ask that question, you know, uh, we still ask that question today among this land that's suffering, that's, that so much healing is needed. What so you have so much passion and energy. I can't imagine you ever fully retiring. But <laughs> at the time when you do slow down enough to look back on your career, the people you've brought together, um, the, the good works, and maybe some of the difficulties, what is the thing that you think you're going to be most proud of? The thing I'm going to be the most proud of is the continuum of the work when I'm not in the work. The Bomb and Gilead, the organization today, continues to ask, you know, why is the land still suffering among you who believe in the one God? So we build the capacity of faith communities to address not just HIV today, but today we address a multitude, as you know, of uh, of health disparities, including, you know, now we are the home of the National Brain Health Center for African Americans and taking on Alzheimer's. That. Yes. So I tend to I tend to attract young people who are just like I was when I was in my 20, 20s and 30s. And that is young people who um, want to make a difference who don't have a clue on what they want to do, uh, but they have they have a passion, they have an energy, they wanna make a difference and they're willing to work. They're willing to work hard. Uh, and those are the young people that, that I attract. And certainly, you know, there are people, young people who come into my space and say, mm -mm, this is just too hard. Um, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I can't do this. Uh, and, and it's okay, you know, we've touched, we've hopefully we've shared something and, and, and they move on. Uh, but then there are those few who stick around and, and I think that's really what it is, that having a commitment uh, to what you believe you have been called to do. Because for those of us who live in this space, like you, who you, you believe you, you've been called to do the work that you do, we we move through it you know we move through the good and bad days because this is not just a job this is a calling uh for for what we've been called to do while we are living in this very finite space right but you'll only succeed in your goals if you can bring everybody on the team together 
Exactly. And I think we do it, you know, all of our lives. We do it while we're in, you know, in elementary school. We do it when we're in high school. We definitely do it when we're in college because we just, unless we're just taking one course and we're sitting home doing nothing. In college, we have several, you know, several subjects that we're studying, you know, and every subject requires, you know, a different outcome. And, and, they, and it requires a different deadline. And we have to keep all of those balls, you know, up in the air. And then we're often working a job, you know? Um, so it's, it's this, and as, as you continue to uh, learn that process in our formative years, that process just gets defined because we're still doing the same thing when we get into, you know, the seasoned successful era of our life. But it starts in, in grade school when you have, um, when I finished uh, grad school uh, in, in Atlanta, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but because I had been studying science, you know, all through, I guess that was, you know, what I was going to do. Um, and I woke up one morning wanting to go to New York. I just had an, a yearning. I have to go to New York City. Because if I can make it in New York, I can make it anywhere.